You're listening to Sunny Side Up, a B2B podcast that brings you the juiciest insights from go to market leaders and practitioners. Hey everyone, welcome back to Sunny Side Up. I'm your host, Chris Moody. Today I'm really excited to have Brian Kotliar with us today talking about unlocking account based marketing success in a resource constrained landscape. So Brian's VP of Marketing and Growth at High Touch, which is a data activation company that helps businesses automatically get their most valuable data into the hands of their business teams. Before that, Brian's been a marketing leader at many of the companies you know and love, like New Relic, where he helped to triple their growth rate under the watchful eye of the public markets. He's also worked extensively in building and growing multiple B2B startups like Sprinkler, Intercom, and Datchess Group, which was acquired by Sprinkler. Brian, thanks for joining us today. Really excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much, and thank you for the kind introduction. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here. Awesome. Well, let's jump right in. I mean, your background is incredible. I think everyone has used at least one of the brands where you've been behind the scenes running marketing. So what helped to motivate your transition from comfortable jobs into the startup world, and how has that shift influenced your career? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um I, I've I've always kind of focused my career on uh, pursuing what I see is like um, sort of big emerging exciting markets. Like I've always felt like I think I'm reasonably smart, but being smart is not as actually useful as being in the right place. And so um, a lot if you look across those companies, whether it was Sprinkler and Dotchess Group, what was that about? That was about social media emerging and this realization that businesses have to figure out how to harness this thing. Or you think about Intercom. And that was really about messaging and chat emerging. And you're watching WhatsApp and you're watching Facebook Messenger, like just change change how people communicate. And it's like, there's got to be a business play here. Um, uh, New Relic I had already obviously been established when I joined, but it was really a bet on this concept of observability. The fact that we're moving to the cloud so aggressively and it's so complex to manage big, complex software in the cloud. And then lastly, my move to, to high touch has really been about what I see as this huge emerging wave that may tie into some of the things we talked about today which is the transition of the data warehouse from an analytical tool adopted by relatively few companies to a business tool adopted by every company. And so like what I've always oriented towards is go to where there's just lots of change and where technology is really shaking the tree a little. And you know, if you can execute even reasonably well in that kind of an atmosphere of, of, of just massive change and disruption, you're more likely not going to be a participant in a pretty good outcome in a pretty good business. And so that's that's always been kind of what steered me over the years. I love that. I love that. I know for me, I, I, I don't always use that same decision framework that you were starting to describe there, but I, I have made a couple moves in, in my career that were the pursuit of passion and where I thought there was pain and a pain that I could help solve that gave me the adrenaline hit. And it, really, money didn't even matter at the point. It was... This feels right, like the right thing in my career. Don't worry about just pure numbers or X's and O's. What are some of the other decision-making criteria you factor into your framework as you make career decisions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, and I want to acknowledge that that's an important one, although it's, it's funny. Like, I kind of think about this almost as like, I don't know, a pyramid or concentric circles or something. And like the first one, the, the baseline of the pyramid is what I just said. Because at least for me, what I believe is that you can usually find something that gives you that little thrill, that little zing in the context of a great market. Um, yes. And my fear is always that I'm going to find my little thriller zing in a, in a bad market. You know, like the famous buggy whip analogy. It's like, do you really want to be the best buggy whip seller in the world? You know, that's going to be pretty tough to make a, make a living, you know? So I always try and figure out where, where is there just a big market? And then I look inside that market for what kind of gives me the thrill. And so for me, it kind of goes first market, then company. Um, and the question is, even in a great market, you know, you need to have a company that can win. And the factors of what a, team, a company can win, I usually evaluate on two axes. The first is uh, the team, because software can be copied. Technology can be copied. You know, unfortunately, like pixels are very hard to build a moat around. And so, um, but what's, what is the difference is the team, the efficacy and speed with which they work, their creativity, their ability to problem solve and all that. So you're kind of looking for some special alchemy amongst the group. And then the other one to me is the tech. Um, though pixels can be copied, um, you know, it is hard. Like, like uh, to give an example, um, here at High Touch, we're competing in a very contested space, but our technology infrastructure approach is a little bit different. And though it can be copied, it's not trivial. And that gives us a couple of years of a head start in certain ways, which is very, very valuable. So like, to repeat, it goes market, 
company team, company tech. And then the last thing for me, that's where I kind of look for that zing, is let's really talk about the role. Is when I think about the role, when I think about getting up early, and I have a toddler, so it's very early, um, to, to get some work done, um, am I looking forward to that or am I dreading it? And, and then when I think about, okay, what are, what's it going to be like when this company misses a quarter? Because every company misses a quarter, right? Like, is am I still going to be passionate and enthusiastic about this or am I here for the paycheck? Um, if you're there for the paycheck and the company misses a quarter, it's probably, and, and you kind of sense that it's taste wrong, it's probably the wrong job. And so for me, I've always found that if I work through this and when I advise people or mentor people, I ask them these questions. If I work through this structure and it's like good market, good company, good tech, and then you have a little thrill when you think about the work, it's kind of hard to go wrong. I'm not, I can't guarantee you're going to make a fortune from an IPO or God knows what, but I, I, I can pretty confidently say it's not going to be a waste of your time, you know? Yeah, I, I really like that framework. Uh, I should steal that. I need to talk to you more. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's such an important combination of factors to think about, right? Because I, I we can all think through our career history and probably find decisions we've made because one of those was lighting up and flashing green to say, this is great, great, great. And, you know, the in prioritization, I, I will say, I, I don't know if I put market as high in the prioritization as I probably should. I think I over-index on teams because once you once you go down the wrong path once in your career, you realize how important the people are and then that does lead to motivation. But I, cool. I think that's awesome. Well, I think, I think you know, it's funny that there's something really important there. There's like uh, that, uh, you know, there's all these ideas in like psychology, like cognitive biases and stuff. And I think that's actually sometimes the power of a framework is to help you avoid certain biases that you may have developed with good reason, like you have scar tissue there. I won't ask you for the details of what you're talking about, but, but it's clear that you have scar tissue there from a professional experience that didn't go the way you want it, right? And the problem is now because of that scar tissue, are you gonna over index in some way that's like not optimal for what you're trying to achieve? And so the nice thing about a framework is it's like, it just is a framework, you know, just sitting there. It doesn't, it's not subject to the biases. How you use it might be, but like, it, you know, if you go through it in that order, it kind of inherently, helps you overcome maybe some of those instinctive biases you might have. I love that. I love that. You worked into a beautiful segue of where my brain wanted to go to, to pull this into B2B marketing. And, you know, I, I mentioned in the title resource constrained, and we all cringe when we say do more with less, because as marketers, I think it's always been a constant. We've always talked about doing more with less, but we see in survey data year after year after year, when we talk to the C-suite, that is the top challenge. Now, many things are harder today than they were five years ago. If you think about demand gen and how we've typically helped to get to our pipeline and revenue goals. So what are some of the biggest challenges you think exist in B2B marketing today? And I know that there's a data story that you want to weave in here too. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, this is one of those ones where that little thrill came from. Like I have, I kind of have religion on how data helps fix so many of the problems that I've confronted and that you and I are talking about right now. And I think, so like, look, I won't, I, I don't want to bore the audience with stuff that they're living through. So I'll just kind of like hint at them and we can go as deep as you might want. But like, look, we all know some things, right? SDR e automation and email stuff is saturated. doesn't work as well as it used to. Um, as B2B marketers, advertising in the non B2B channels like LinkedIn and stuff is super difficult. And even in LinkedIn, um, the cost of media is super high and you can't always find your persona depending on your persona. We also know that things like, like the old Marketo style, you know, concept of the funnel working, up, working down from, you know, MQL down through close one, it feels, it doesn't feel like it quite works anymore. And actually I generally have encountered a lot of skepticism of it these days from both marketing leaders and sales leaders. They're like, you're still talking about MQLs, you know? Um, we have this dynamic with PLG and product-led growth as this other way of growing. And so like the combination of all this stuff is that like, you know, we're here, we're like, I don't know about you, but I know for me, I'm staring at a bonkers growth number I have to hit for this year and the next. Um, and a lot of the old playbook doesn't work. Um, and, and so you, how do you solve it? And I think my uh, sort of aha moment uh, is that one of the ways to make some of the old tactics work again as well as unlock new ones, is the, the data resource that the data warehouse represents. Um, there is, uh, it's hard, I feel like I'm on a monologue here, so I'm trying to think uh, uh, to how to explain this, but basically, 
we have never had the depth and quality and richness of data available to us as B2B marketers as we as we do today in the data warehouse, like ever. I've been doing this for almost two decades and I can tell you this is different. Um, now, not every company has actually built one, equipped it with all the information they need or even figured out how to use it. I acknowledge that. But what I am saying is like, this is the future. It just is. Buy high touch, don't. Buy Snowflake, don't. Buy BigQuery, don't. It doesn't really matter about the tech. What I'm trying to communicate to the audience and what I talk to everybody about when we're thinking through these growth problems is if you're not figuring out how to build up a really deep well of first party data and then manipulate it and use it to resurrect old tactics and invent new ones, you're in some trouble because uh, all these things that we've relied on for years just don't seem to work very well. Yeah, I, I love that. And, you know, my brain goes to what I think is a traditional problem in marketing and sales tech of where we tend to sell to people like us far too often and not people who may not be quite as far along if they haven't worked at a lot of high growth SaaS companies and change jobs every three years or ish, right? There, there's always a, a story that I've continued to observe, especially as I was acquired into Gartner, where you start to see the world has different challenges than what we're living. So if we take the piece where you were saying that you know, everyone needs to be thinking about this, even if they aren't today. Mm -hmm. I love the the rising tides, raise all boats that you were hitting on there too, right? Like just start to do this. What would be your hand on the shoulder advice to a B2B marketing team that may say, we're struggling to get all of our data in one place. We're measuring different metrics. We're not really thinking about comprehensive decisions because we're in different systems, which we know those are alignment challenges. We survey this frequently. We know that they still pop up. So if we if we know that that's the case, what would be that that nudge to encourage someone who may be on the fence to really consider how they're taking advantage of the, all the data they have? Yeah. Well, the thing I always say is that, like, um, you know, I, my team gets annoyed at me because I'm always dad joking them to death. But it's like, how do you eat an elephant? You know, one bite at a time. Um, and so like, I always think about this when I'm advising people, when I'm working through these problems with my team is like, let's start with a use case and work backwards. And the power of that is that you essentially, you only troubleshoot and sort out the, the stuff you need to get an outcome. Now I'll acknowledge this isn't this, this won't necessarily like help you do it, just be giant systems or architecture or whatever. I, I acknowledge that. But to me, every project I've ever seen, that's like this huge waterfall project of let's re-architect everything. You know, the past is bad, embrace the future. They all fail. I've never seen one work and I've been at this for a while. So, but what I have seen work consistently, the pattern that almost never fails is start with your use case and work backwards. And so like, here's an example for B2B stuff, right? You're like, gosh, I have a SaaS product. There's tons of interesting usage data in there that I could be using to inform my account teams on upsell opportunities. I bet you, at least everyone in your audience right now that's in B2B SaaS, I know there's many others as well, but just as an example, has this problem, has thought about this. The classic way to solve that use case of like, I need to create signals and inform, you know, based off product signals, is some sort of a bonkers mess of systems integrations using Zapier and Tray and Salesforce tasks and this and that, this huge monstrosity mess that like no one can really understand, no one can really administer, it breaks all the time, whatever. Now, but you might still be doing it. In fact, I did do that. I did that at New Relic. I did that at Intercom. Um, what I discovered though later as the data warehouse started to come to be is that the only system, and Salesforce cannot do this, the only system that can ingest all that data out of the product and then make it like manageable, intelligible, and usable for this purpose is a data warehouse. It's the only thing. And with new technologies like high touch, but not only high touch, you can very trivially move that data into things like Slack, things like email, things like Salesforce. And so you come up with this very simple architecture to solve your problem. Rather than create this crazy spider web of stuff, you just say, I need this one data point to show up in Slack. How do I do that? Well, I have my data team move that one data point out of the database that backs my product into Snowflake. And then I have them set up a trigger into my Slack. That's it. Now I've got that one. Is that one working? Is that one good? Yes, no. If yes, make more. Um, and, and, and so I'm giving you a very specific one just to illustrate the idea of like, do not eat the elephant, eat its toenail. You know, this is a terrible metaphor. I can't believe I just said that. But you know what I mean? Like you got to start somewhere and start with something you can actually do and show some value off of. Um, and, and this path I'm saying to you, though, is this architecture. It scales. 
It's like, okay, what else might we want to know? Well, uh, something we actually, I have a playbook for this. I can share if you want, but it's like, okay, I want to do better churn aversion. Well, what does that entail? Well, emailing somebody who hasn't logged in for a while, telling a success team that you're 90 days out from renewal and usage is plummeting or whatever. Um, well, how do you do that? Well, guess what? It's the same workflow. Get the data out of the product, move it to the warehouse, create the signal, move the signal. The workflow scales, but you just start with one. Um, and so that's kind of the advice I give everybody. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I want to come back to some of the skills that you may think we all need as we move more into the data warehouse landscape and thinking that way for data-driven decisions. But what, one thing to, to hit on before we get there, many folks are embracing account base and too many of those are actually just doing slightly more targeted demand generation. That was one thing I saw over and over and over as an analyst where you know, calling it account-based and just slightly improving an MQL model is not really account-based. And one of the things that we would typically say was just start with one account to your point of, just, you know, the toenail of the elephant, right? Just pick one account and figure out what that motion feels like and how you collaborate truly collaborate between marketing, sales, customer success throughout the entire journey, throw the funnel out the window for a second and just think, what would we do if we all work together and start there? What are some of those trends that you're seeing in the space where you do think, hey, here are opportunities to take those tiny little approaches to figure out how to take things like your playbook and look, here's a trigger. Here's how we're going to start to act on these triggers. Here's how we treat them like pilot projects. So it's not that huge, massive decision fatigue, or I have to get all these folks bought in. What would be some of the starting points or use cases that you're seeing a lot? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I, first of all, I fully endorse kind of your point about like, you know, maybe starting with one account is too small. I don't know. It really depends on your situation, but starting small, I fully endorse. I think that that's right. It gives you, it de-risks the project in terms of, you know, like the profile of it. So you can be wrong for longer and make more errors. And so like, I really believe that that's very, very helpful. And it also brings a lot more creativity into a, like a focus zone. So I think even right there, if people just did that versus the opposite, you would already be better off, you know? Um, but let's assume you're kind of operating in that sphere. Like what are some, some common patterns I'm noticing? <clears throat> well, um, one is um, this idea of personalization. Um, now, in the context of one account, you don't really need to have like that much tech-enabled personalization. Uh, but if you're doing it at any sort of scale, you know, to lots and lots of people in one account or in a um, decent number of people across even a few dozen accounts, um, personalization is hard. And it often kind of starts to fall apart a little bit on the marketing to seller handoff partnership. Because sellers have got a million things going on. And unless they were hired yesterday with like a blank book, they have like a ton to do in terms of renewals and upsells and, you know, support and all this crap that, you know, AEs have to deal with. And so um, I think a big thing that we as marketers can do is we can use the technology at our disposal to make personalization easy. And so one pattern I'm seeing a lot of people doing is they're trying to figure out how do I like gather up as many data points as possible and sort of create them as like resource referenceable variables either for human behavior or machine behavior. So if it's a human, one thing, for example, we do at high touch is we, we do a bunch of account research automated with like GPT and stuff and we validate it. And then we load it into Salesforce's notes. You, that, that's just starting point. Like we could do all kinds of crazy automation with it, but we perceive that the first problem is just getting that stuff in the hands of the reps and reducing the time to do that research. So that's an example of a way that like, you can really deliver a lot of value to your reps, increase the efficacy of their work without doing a bunch of crazy sci-fi stuff, you know? Now, in, in our case, we actually did, I can talk about it if you want, like did do some sci-fi stuff with it after. But step one was actually a really simple workflow of this account with this particular query, which I'm happy to share, run it in GPT uh, or one of the other APIs, bring it back and just load it into notes. A person can do that. An intern can do that if you want. No tech required, you know? 20 bucks a month and an intern. Uh, so, so that, that's kind of a, a very common starting point just make the personalization easier. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I mean, even we, we always <laughs> overcomplicate everything and assume there's this sophisticated usage by general public. That's just not happening. I mean, even intent data, I, I kind of group it as, you know, 70% are just using intent data to say, go after these accounts. And then 20% are saying, 
go after these accounts and talk to them about this because we know they're talking about this. Just that simple piece. And then the other 10% are saying, go after them, talk to them about this. And oh, by the way, we have a subject matter expert. And here's the meeting we should be talking about. Just the baby steps of being slightly more personalized and relevant based on those data points. I think that's a perfect example. And, you know, you mentioned some of the sci-fi things. Uh, you can cover those. That'd be great. But I'd love to hear about your account-based marketing program and what you're doing and kind of share how you're using data to shape it and turn it into a you know, evolving strategic approach and you can get as sci-fi as you want talking about that. Too. Cool. Well, I will, I, I, I will speak, you know, a little like it, some of this, it will probably be challenging for people to execute. I'm going to acknowledge, um, but I want to be clear just up front. Our team is small. Our company is only like a hundred people. Our ops team is two, really one and a half, you know, like, uh, like, so we are doing this with not a lot of resources, not a lot of people, but we're doing some stuff that I even actually couldn't even pull off at New Relic with a budget of tens of millions and a team of hundreds. So like, this is again, why I'm so excited about data because it's such a force multiplier. Um, like what I threw people at and New Relic, I now throw SQL queries at. Uh, and by the way, I don't write SQL, so I, like I delegate that. But nonetheless, um, and 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 it, I just am in awe of how far we're able to travel with so little. So to, to be specific, so um, here's an example of workflow that we that we have figured out that's been really effective for us. So we did that initial GPT thing, and we gave it to the reps, and that was great. You know, some of the reps did it, some didn't. You know, rep adoption is always a little hit and miss. Um, uh, but then we thought to ourselves, okay, how do we help? So we thought, okay. Um, we have what's called the headless content management system, meaning it's one that kind of can dynamically create pages and things, you know, they're contentful and content stack and sanity and all those kinds of things. Um, and we thought to ourselves, well, could we take the variables of how a, a landing page renders and have it populate those things that we now know from GPT for a company? So if I made, you know, whatever, hightouch.com slash Nestle, could I have Nestle things on a landing page just rendered automatically so that we don't have to go and manually make them in WordPress or whatever? And I asked my front end engineer, again, we're a small company. I have half of one. And she's like, yeah, because we use a headless CMS, that's actually pretty trivial. And she had it set up in like a week. So then we said, all right, I can make landing pages. How do I get people to these things? Again, I'm, I'm and just to, to explicate, by the way, I think I'm going by use cases. If you notice, I'm eating my elephant a little at a time. Right. So how do I, I, I have, I need a, I need a custom content asset. Great, I got GPT. Great, now I have tokenized landing pages. How do I get people to tokenize landing pages? Well, the typical ones, right, would be emailing people and ads. Um, the AEs were already supposed to be doing the emailing, TBD if they were, but they were supposed to be. So I said, I'll leave that aside for now. I'm going to focus on ads for a minute. And so um, we thought, okay, well, how do we stand out in this mass of just LinkedIn garbage that everyone is always exposed to and, you know, whatever else? How do I find these people on Facebook? So on the LinkedIn side, we said, well, why don't we take all that same information and make it part of the ad. So we found another uh, super cheap, I actually think it was free thing that lets us um, uh, automatically generate ad, ad creative. And the ad creative we use actually shows the particular tech stack of the company we want. And, and in the copy, it shows one of the GPT summaries of their business problem. And then, okay, how do I actually, so now I have great place to send them. I have great content to get their attention, but now how do I target the damn thing? Um, and so we had to really screw around with LinkedIn targeting. And this is, you know, this is just El Bogris is our ad, our, our ad team, which is a guy part time, um, uh, figuring out that like he could actually build targeting account by account targeting in LinkedIn and then load the creative in and have it show to certain titles and personas. And what we found was as compared to our typical ads, um, the CPC on LinkedIn is typically very high. You know, you're talking in some, some cases, 12, $15. For these, it's a buck. So for a dollar, I can get my persona to my landing page. And on that landing page, I can show them exactly the value prop I want. Um, and so little by little, we worked backwards from problem to problem to problem. It all started with us loading all this cool GPT stuff into our warehouse, moving it from there into our CRM and into our other product platforms or products or whatever. But like now we have this kind of closed loop workflow of super customized everything. For any account, arbitrarily, it's like end accounts. Put in any account you want, this thing works out. Comes out the other side at a buck a click from the right people. Um, and then the next thing, kind of sci-fi-ish thing we're doing, is we have the ability, and I acknowledge I'm sort of pitching you my product at this moment. This is something we sell, but you can do it with other products too, I think. Um, so we have the ability with High Touch to um, do essentially uh, match boosting. 
where you put in a B2B account, uh, sorry, put in a B2B email or a B2B person's Gmail, and we can find them on Snapchat and TikTok and Facebook. Maybe even DemandBase can do this too. I'm not sure. But we can, so we can find your B2B buyers on non-B2B platforms. Because usually the problem is the match rate. You put in all your B2B emails, you get like a half percent match rate on TikTok. You're like, well, screw this. Um, with this match boosting tech, that number goes from a half percent. I literally was just looking at our data before this call. It's up to 20%. So I can match 20% of my targets over there and still use the same really hyper-targeted creative and landing pages. And the clicks are even cheaper. A buck seems expensive compared to what I can get over there. Um, it's still that same targeting. And so this all goes back to, so I start with the data. I build the picture of the person in the data. And then I find all these cool ways to use it to solve my business problem. I love that. I love that. If we if we zoom out a couple clicks, uh, you're seeing a lot of different trends and insights as you help others to do this too, which is one of the beautiful things about being in the space that you're in. It's not just doing it yourself, it's watching other people do it. What are some of those skills that you think we all need to be thinking about specific to marketers first, and then maybe even specific to sellers? What are some of the learnings you have where if you were reverse engineering a resume for a job rec of the future, mm -hmm. what would be some of the considerations? Yeah, well, I mean, on one hand, I can say that um, the, some of the fundamentals don't change. That's not the most exciting answer. So I'll give you some interesting stuff too, but I'll just start with the boring, the boring truth because sometimes the truth is just boring, which is that like, um, we don't really know where this technology is going to go. It's early days for the data warehouse. It's early, uh, or the cloud data warehouse at least. It's early days for how we can use these new ad technologies and these new content technologies. What's not going to change is like, can you think systemically? Can you run, manage a really good project? Do you know how to set up good, a good KPI dashboard and explain it to your senior stakeholders to get budget? So like, like a lot of the, this theoretical job description I'm writing it's actually just for like a really good buttoned up, thoughtful, process driven, quantitatively minded person, which is the same thing you would have written six years ago, you know? So, and 60 years ago, probably, I don't know what they were doing six years ago, but you know, whatever. Um, now, but in terms of the net new, um, one of the things I talk a lot about with my team and it really helps part of why we're able to move so fast um, with so few people. I mean, literally I got half a person on that whole program I just told you about. Um, is um, is that the team itself is actually pretty knowledgeable of, of how to query data. So like uh, Alex, who manages this program for us, he can write a quick and dirty SQL query to get whatever he wants out of the database on his own without waiting around for a ticket. Gab's on my team, also does not know SQL, but she knows how to use um, a visual, like High Touch has a visual interface that essentially lets people like me uh, do SQL queries without knowing SQL. And Gab's same, she doesn't know. So we have tooling now to make these really dense, kind of challenging environments like a data warehouse that previously were inaccessible to marketers, actually very usable. And so Gabs goes in there all the time, doesn't know a lick of SQL and can navigate these huge data sets to find what she needs and go run our email program or, or whatever else. And so something, I guess the theme here is it's kind of like either a willingness to really dive in and learn or of developing other ways to interface with these huge pieces of technology that were previously and maybe still are a little bit intimidating. And I acknowledge it, it's a little scary um, to be, I, shoot, I, I'm a liberal arts major. I studied European history, you know, like I, I, I know more than I probably should talk about, about like, you know, they ask you how often does your husband think about Rome? For me daily. Um, and uh, so I acknowledge it. it's a little scary for those of us, you know, like that. But the truth is you have to learn or figure out a way. There's the Gab's way, find the right tooling to get access. There's the Alex way. Just become a lightweight analyst and learn learn how to interact with this stuff. But either way, I don't think it's optional. When I was at New Relic, we used to offer um, like a multi-thousand dollar budget to anyone on our ops team to go take SQL classes. Um, I don't have that luxury because we're small here at High Touch. But I thought it was some of the best money I spent every year at, at New Relic was just sending my crew to learn SQL. Because it's, it's kind of the, I guess to go back to history stuff, it's the lingua franca of data. And data is how we, just how this whole thing runs, you know? Love that. A lot of profound things were packed in there too. I mean, the, I, I think that curiosity is such an important piece. If we go back, you and I have both been in this industry about the same amount of time. And if you go back to when we first started, I think any good break 
anyone's had that we know or ourselves came from that curiosity to mm-hmm. just chase things down, figure it out, even if it's dirty, just go in, try to learn more about it. And then that leads to the next great thing. So I, I do think that's certainly a trait to look for in anyone and then to try to grow in our teams too. Yeah, no, for sure. And it, this is a great moment. It's it, curiosity. I, I would actually say for for years now, curiosity has been rewarded because there's so much technical innovation happening in our space. But I feel especially right now, um, in part because some of the old stuff's not working as well as it used to. And so this is a great moment where like, it's, you know, uh, it's the it's necessity is the mother of invention kind of moment. And, and so the curious people are going out to the edges of, of what's obvious and trying things that are not obvious to, to just to, to, to make stuff work, to be effective in their role. And, and, and those that are incurious, what I've noticed is they, they're running the old playbooks in a context where they don't work anymore. And it's in, in that, I, I, don't, I don't mean to disparage those people. I get it. But like, I feel like that's a really important thing to ask ourselves as we all kind of turn the corner to next year's planning right now. And I always talk to my to the team about how marketers sort of live in the future. The leads we create today, they make money later. So for us, it's our really it's next fiscal year now, really. And so I'm talking to the team a lot about uh, forget this year, the pipeline we generated will close or it won't. What about next? And we have to be ready to abandon anything that's ineffectual and be curious to figure out what will be effectual. And that's that's scary, but. I don't know any other way to do it. Love it. This is really helpful. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of questions. You offered up some content you can share too. So we'll, we'll get to that, how we can get in touch with you after the podcast. But we do have a couple questions we asked to wrap. They do come from a place of curiosity as well. <laughs> uh, the first is about good reads, which I have a feeling you may have some suggestions here that other folks are not thinking about based on your background and how often you think about Rome. But <laughs> Uh, is there a book, blog, newsletter, website, or video that you would recommend to our listeners? And you can have more than one, too. Sure, sure, sure. You know, actually, it's funny. I just shared this with somebody yesterday, but I'll share it now with your team. This thing's out of print. It's a little hard to get your hands on, but you can find it on Amazon. It's called Managing Oneself. It's written by Peter Drucker, you know, the famous management consultant. Yes. This is like a, I, I think it, it's shorter than a sub stack. It's like easy, you know? Um, but I, this is one of those ones, you know, I talk about how like there's like these like just fundamental truths of, for being effective. So this is a really wonderful short read about being an effective executive. And I, I was recommended to me by a mentor of mine. And I always, I pick it up every time I start a new job or when I'm like feeling that inevitable tension of like feeling stuck in a current role, I just pause. I pick up my, my handy little book here that's always behind me. And it takes me no time at all to reread it, but it really helps focus and clarify how to use my time. That's probably the biggest thing. You know, how we use our time is the biggest indicator of our priorities and whether or not we're going to be effective. And I'm... I'm not ashamed to say that like uh, some days I'll wake up on a Friday and be like, what just happened? Did I actually help my company make any money this week? Was I act, did I actually use my time to be a good husband or a good dad? Like what's going on? And I find that the, my, my little ritual of returning to this has been really helpful. So that that's definitely one I can offer people more like fundamentals again, maybe boring, but helpful. Um, and yeah, I think it's like $3 on, on Amazon, whatever, if you can find it. Um, uh, and then I'll just give a, a shout out to a friend of mine, uh, but, but a vendor I use a lot in a blog I love. So there's this guy named Pep Laha, um, and he runs a, a user feedback startup called Winter with a Y. And man, is that thing helpful. Um, I don't know if you've come across it, but you can essentially throw any static asset, like a PDF, a landing page, a homepage or whatever. And they will, within like a day or two, get you feedback from your target market. And the, and the, that, the key thing being a day or two. You know, of course, we can all get feedback if we interview 30 people, but it takes a long time and you need to release your new homepage now. Right. Uh, so I, I love it because I can just take a screenshot of the new H1 we're thinking about, dump it in there. And a day later, I'll have feedback from a bunch of really good people. So I would just definitely give uh, give them a shout out and, and, and say if you're kind of stuck on a headline or what your new homepage should be or what your new landing page should be, uh, I would give that a go as a way to kind of break ties and give yourself some new ideas. Love that. And I have run across them before. I think that's such an incredible service that they offer. And I, a lot of my job is interviewing people. So a, anything I can have to supplement those longer qualitative interviews, I think that's extremely helpful. You mentioned a person there, but any great people that you'd recommend both for the audience or as future guests of the show? Sure. Um, well, 
you know, uh, maybe you know who might be really good and somebody I, I don't know how much he writes in public, but there's this guy I know. His name is uh, Francois Dufour. He used to be the CMO of Twilio, um, and he advises a lot of companies now and things like that. And gosh, is he smart? Um, and uh, and also he just is really on the kind of the edge of all the B two B stuff that we're all thinking about and working on as he advises companies and things. So he might be a, a, a great person to check out if folks don't know him and, and, and somebody to take a look at. And then I'll just give a shout out to my old colleague that I, I, I always, I learned so much from this, this fellow named Manav. He spoke at Saster, uh, uh, one of the keynotes, I want to say this past year. And he talked a lot about what we did at New Relic, where we used PLG and consumption pricing and things to help revive. I don't want to say revive, that's probably too negative, but help reactivate growth for New Relic. Uh, and it worked out pretty damn well. They just got acquired for a boatload of money. Uh, and uh, Manav was a huge factor in that. You know, I played my part, but but obviously, you know, I acknowledge, you know, that others did a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, and Manav is certainly one of them. So if folks haven't, I would recommend you check out his Saster talk. Um, it's really inspiring. And you can learn a lot about some of the things we've talked about. Like, how do you bring these new ideas and these aggressive ways of trying to grow kind of at the edges of what's obvious? into a business that maybe otherwise isn't ready for it. You know, and it's not easy to do. Love that. And you're not going to believe this because we missed this in our prep call when you and I were talking, but that you're talking about Marav, Manav Karana. And I, I did a project for Manav when he was at Envision. Oh, really? So I that's actually good. did work for him and just now realized, ah, oh, that's another intersecting point you and I have. So mm-hmm. Manav, is awesome. I'll certainly reach out to him. Maybe we can get him on the show too. So we'll we'll link up to that talk. Yeah, if you can, I recommend it. I think I think your audience would learn a lot. Uh, and he's got some really great stories of, of what both Envision and Twilio before that, and then and then New Relic most recently. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, you mentioned awesome resources you have, things that you could share. What's the best way for the audience to get in touch with you after the podcast? I mean, the easiest thing is probably just look at me up on LinkedIn. Just, you know, my name and high touch. Or I don't think there's that many Brian Cotliers roaming around, so you can probably track me down that way. And then the other thing is we try and publish all these things I'm talking to you about as what we call playbooks. They're, they're not really particularly proprietary. Like the sequel we write, which is just generic, you could use anywhere, is in the playbooks. So if you just go to hightouch.com and look in the little resources section for the, the playbooks, um, we've got one on how to do ABM account notifications. We've got another on how to do ABM email personalization and all this stuff. And of course, they're written in our case because we use high touch to use high touch, but you don't have to. So if you just want ideas or, 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 or in some cases, like literal like stereo instructions, like plug in the cable here, turn the knob this way, kind of to do some <laughs> of this stuff, you should just check out the playbooks. It really is that easy. Sounds great. We'll check it out. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today, Brian. Really enjoyed having you. Yeah, it's been great, great to talk with you. And I mean, you know, as you can tell, I'm a geek for this stuff. So it's been great to be here. Me too. All right. Well, thanks. Talk soon. Yep. Talk soon. Bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Sunny Side Up. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review us and subscribe to our show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube and Demand Based TV. 